consider supporting Archaea Soup on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Link available in video description. Thank you. Hello, and welcome back to another Real World Archaeology. In this series, we watch film, TV, and other media with a view to understanding how historically and archaeologically accurate they are. I suppose you could say we sort of review films, for example, from a standpoint of a balance between entertainment and historical accuracy, and how those, thing to those two things coexist or even compromise one another. For example, it's entirely possible to have a really, really entertaining movie that is just historical nonsense. It's also possible to have a really you know, historically accurate film that's very well researched, and very, very good, that, that, that is just not remotely entertaining. And and in, in previous episodes of this series, I've, I've presented that balance for you uh, with a blow-by-blow -blow account, a sort of fine-tooth comb approach to the movie in question. Uh, for example, I really enjoyed doing a joint review with Liv of the movie Outlander, where it was a Viking versus space monsters, kind of Beowulf B-movie sci-fi epic, uh, where we presented the historical accuracies, even the accidental ones, with a tick, and the inaccuracies, and also the egregious you know, historical badness with a cross. And out of that you got a score, uh, and also an overview, I suppose, of how the, the story of the film proceeded. Uh, and we, we presented that to you over the course of two videos. Uh, I did something similar with the movie 10,000 BC. That was also two videos, and, and at the end of that you got this score that, that gave you a sense of how historically accurate the film was. That was a much less enjoyable experience, if I'm honest. That was quite arduous. Um, but also, today's film has got me thinking that, that, that maybe there's another way, and it inspired me to, to approach this, this format and maybe refresh it slightly uh, for, 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 for a few different reasons. So today's film is Early Man from Ardman Animation Studios. It was released... Uh, on the 26th of January, earlier this year, that was the UK cinema release at least, and that's often an indicator as to how confident a studio or Hollywood is in, in the film. Early in the year is when there's less box office money floating around, and so they save the better films for the summer, and they put out the, the ones that are a bit dodgy, maybe an odd sort of weird horror film or... Uh, a Nicolas Cage movie or some of his latest ones earlier in the year as a punt, I suppose. Well, maybe people will go and see it, but we're not wasting that summer slot on this film. And so having Early Man released so early in the year was a bit of a, a bit of an indicator that it might be not as good as the other Ardman Stella productions. Things like uh, Wallace and Gromit, Chicken Run, uh, the the Scientists and and um, and Pirates Adventure movie, and and also Shaun the Sheep even as a film was quite good. Uh, uh, the, the, these these things set a really high bar, and really from from the get go, I just want to say that Early Man doesn't live up to that high standard. It doesn't certainly doesn't raise that bar uh, by any means. So. My first reason for, for revisiting this format is that I don't want to pull this film apart, you know, like pulled pork. I don't want to shred the thing because it is nonetheless an entertaining film to a certain extent. You know, it is an Aardman production. These are the guys who made Wallace and Gromit. It is fun, you know, so I didn't want to just, just tear it, tear it to pieces. Um, the second reason is that uh, I don't want to spoil the, 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 the story. In that previous way of reviewing movies, we literally go, it's an account of the whole film. We go through the whole story and how what happens to characters and how things progress. And therefore, it, it's, a, it's an epic spoiler. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's, there's no reason for you to go away and watch the film, really, uh, unless, unless you, you, you want to check up on what we've been saying, I suppose, in some respects. 
Um, and finally, with this film, I didn't want to spoil the jokes either. There's lots of there's not, there are lots of jokes that do, in various ways, do or don't work. But there are there is humour and there's value here that that that, that would be ruined by a, a moment by moment slow retelling of the whole film. Uh, so I, th I figured that, that Early Man is a good opportunity to revisit this format and in the course of one video you will get a more focused review that gives you my thoughts and impressions as I suppose a review should uh, uh, should be that therefore empowers you to go away and make your own decision about whether or not you want to watch this film for yourself especially now that for example Early Man is out on DVD and Blu-ray. So that's what we're going to do from now on with these movies, a, a, a streamlined approach. Uh, and actually today I'll be presenting to you five good things and five bad things about the film, even though there are more than five bad things about this movie and the bad far outweighs the good, a sort of a balanced good and bad with uh, some comments and thoughts at the end to, to give you my, my own overriding opinion of the film. And then you can do what you want with that information. And, and the film hasn't been forensically destroyed and pulled apart for you. Uh, the other upside as well is that hopefully this means that you get more film reviews from me. Um, 10,000 BC, for example, was a really arduous, you know, really tiring experience that kind of puts me off wanting to do, or do one for a while. So hopefully you'll get more and they'll be more useful. So with that in mind, we shall proceed. So, this film is currently out on Blu-ray and DVD. <laughs> uh, and incidentally, this DVD copy was sent my way by an anonymous person who wanted me to review the film. Presumably they were done with their copy, but thank you, nonetheless, thank you, whomsoever you may be, for this DVD. And I'm just going to start by reading the back of the box, actually. Uh, a Stone Age smash from the Wallace and Gromit team, says the Daily Mail. Gloriously funny, says the Guardian. Uh, uh, on the front of the box, we are told that we're going to meet the ancestors of Shaun the Sheep, Chicken Run, and Wallace and Gromit. And, and in that sense, they're very consciously hitching that Ardman legacy to this film. They want you to think of Wallace and Gromit when you see the box. And even though that's, that is achieved through the art style, obviously the clay characters are very reminiscent of, of that world, they're making that connection for you. This film is directed by Nick Park, the creator of Wallace and Gromit, and I think this is the first one he's directed in a while. I think he's been a producer on recent Aardman productions. Make of that what you will. Uh, anyway, four and five star reviews across the board uh, are quoted at least. And on the back of the box it says, Set at the dawn of time, when prehistoric creatures and woolly mammoths roamed the earth. Early Man tells the story of how a plucky caveman called Doug voiced by Eddie Redmayne, uh, along with his sidekick Hognob, not Hobnob, that's a biscuit, Hognob, who is a wild boar, uh, unites his tribe against the mighty Lord Nooth, Tom Hiddleston, and his Bronze Age city in a battle to beat them at their own game. Early Man unleashes unforgettable, uh, hilarious new characters voiced by top British talent. So the film uh, is 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 really bigged up on the box, and it is promising a lot. And of course, that is the job of the box, you know, to do that. But for me, sadly, not only does it not quite live up to that legacy of Ardman, the first disappointment comes in the first shot of the film. It's, it's such a shame. And in that sense, the first bad I have to mention is the opening of the film, where we are we see Earth floating in space and the, the camera zooms in on earth and we see a volcanic landscape where dinosaurs are fighting each other and and at this point i was thinking this could go down one of two routes you know and it, both of them could be could be magnificent one of them could be a really hammy ray harryhausen kind of dinosaurs versus king kong versus humans kind of film and i would have bought it that would have been fun i would have bought into that you know the other direction is to go sort of serious and uh, as it says here you know, meet the ancestors of, of Wallace and Gromit. So this is a world that's, that's going to end up in that in that time and place that Wallace and Gromit is set. And in, indeed, we are told that this is prehistoric Manchester. So it is sort of semi-serious. But they do neither. They act, well, they sort of try to do both, but they sort of squash it together, it falls flat, and it doesn't really work. Not least because we are told, welcome to the Neo-Pleistocene age. 
such a waste actually of a, of a, of a potential joke there yeah, this this should have been the plasticine age in fact i even saw the director nick park in interviews talking about the plasticine age and making a plasticine joke but instead they get the reference wrong in terms of real ge geology and they they miss out on a potential hilarious joke it all just <clears throat> falls flat and that's that's the first bad of this film it is, it, it is archaeologically and historically bad but also it's for me it's it's bad in terms of the tone of the film as well it's a, it's a real missed opportunity uh, an object falls from space creates a crater smashes into the ground and uh, and humans come to investigate and it's fairly quickly clear that these aren't quite modern humans uh, the same as Doug and the other characters we see in the film these guys have a mono brow they're a bit more maybe neanderthal like you know a bit of a stereotype in that sense and they start to 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 juggle this thing oh it's quite hot to begin with and then they kick it about and suddenly they're playing football and that's actually something which I'm going to I'm going to come back to at the at the end of this review is that this this film is actually a football film. Really, it's actually a film about soccer, about British or English, sorry, English football. Uh, so that's a, that's an odd thing. Anyway, so they start playing football, and someone sets up a goalpost, reminiscent of Stonehenge, that kind of thing, and then we see uh, an artist painting the scene on a rock. So, so the opening is bizarre, to say the least, and it all starts, for me at least, on a bad point. A bad missed opportunity, and that's a real shame. Flash forward in time to, I suppose, technically the end of the Neolithic, in, in terms of you know, archaeological timelines. But anyway, we see some Stone Age people living in a valley, and this is Doug and his tribe. And I want to say that there's something really good here even though these are people living a sort of a paleo paleolithic lifestyle maybe mesolithic ish in the neolithic they get yeah, it's all a mash mush, a mishmash sort of squash pastiche uh what we do see nonetheless is people who are not living in caves that's a positive they're not living in caves most prehistoric people did not live in caves we find art in caves because the art survives in caves. That's where the wind and the rain couldn't get at the art. They probably drew on stones all over the place, just as we saw actually in that opening sequence. Uh, but uh, but but I'd like to I'd like to to flag that to praise the film for showing these people not living in caves, even though they're referred to as cavemen throughout the film. It's a bit weird, but that's a good. They're not living in caves. The next positive is a subtle one, uh, but it, it, <laughs> it, it occurs in the most unsubtle way I can possibly imagine anything anything occurring. Uh, and we see this in the trailer. It is, the, it is the arrival of the Bronze Age into the valley. A mammoth arrayed in bronze armour just crashes through the trees and someone just announces, The Age of Stone is over! <laughs> Welcome to the Edge of Bronze. Uh, it, it's the most, uh, on the face of it, the most ridiculous thing because that's just not how history works. People that just go, right, okay, um, we are now um, uh, Tudors. Yes, that's what we want. We are Tudors now. Yesterday we weren't, but today we're Tudors. Yes, that's not how history happens. So in some ways, it, this could be bad, but it's good because I like the subtle reference to uh, the, the continental connection. This idea of, of a Frenchman, played by Tom Hiddleston, ar arriving and announcing the Bronze Age is, is a reference to, I think, the Beaker people. And actually, there are, there, there are references to Beaker people in the movie later on. Uh, so I like this, that, that the idea of that Bronze came to Britain from the continent with a, a culture, quite possibly, that was attached to it, that linked with certain types of pottery, certain ways of living, is actually a positive. It's a subtle thing hidden behind that giant mess of, a, of an announcement, but it's wonderful. It's funny and I appreciate it. So that's a positive. Unfortunately, the rest of the Bronze Age, as shown in this movie, is a massive negative. The Bronze Age is basically medieval, but actually medieval plus. It's medieval with certain mod cons. We see in, in Lord Nuth's city 
uh, loo roll, so the invention of paper, but also using paper to, to wipe bottoms. Uh, glass, which is perfectly clear. Uh, at one point, uh, Doug walks into a glass pane. Uh, we see soap bars, we see plumbing and taps. There's a football stadium. There's basically Tudor architecture. It's a bit of a disappointment to see the Bronze Age as essentially, essentially the modern, you know, the, or the early modern world, actually. Uh, and I understand that thematically, this idea of progress is important for the film and these two ideals clashing. But it's it's a it's a crass it's a crass duality to have what they what they call cavemen versus what is basically Tudor medieval England. It's for me that's a that's a negative. It, they could have they could have been a bit more subtle uh, in how they showed the Bronze Age. For example, a positive is Doug's response to the Bronze Age. At some point he finds himself in this Bronze Age city and we see him fascinated by certain subtle key things. One of them is the wheel. There's a cart that goes past and he's just sort of mesmerized by this wheel, this wooden thing that's turning and rolling. And that actually is a huge positive. I'm very impressed that they, that they resisted the temptation to show stone wheels and do like a Flintstones vehicles type thing because actually in the real world wheels weren't a thing until the Bronze Age we start to see tracks for example from wheels in Britain in the Bronze Age so seeing subtle references to 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 new things amazing uh, Doug is a really good thing and that, that's that's the way the Bronze Age and its effect could have been explored wheels uh, metal as well he, he at one point he walks into some uh, some bronze pans bunk you know ding 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 and the the sound of the metal the, the he picks it up he's looking at it that is how the Bronze Age and 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 it's it's uh, exoticism I guess could and should have been more subtly uh, shown and it and 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 the allure of the bronze as well uh, maybe the temptation to become bronze age people themselves could have been in this film but for the most part it's not the, these subtle things are in the film and that's a positive but they're very much overshadowed by the the medieval bronze age that we see uh for the most part there is a similarly subtle negative aspect to the Bronze Age in this film. And this is one that I think was, was done by accident, unthinkingly. Uh, and that is how those people who are in charge amass and maintain their power. Now, football stadiums and taps and soap and loo roll to one side, the idea is that Lord Newth oversees football matches. People come to the stadium, they pay to get in using bronze coinage, and we'll just we'll put coins to one side. Never mind the the weirdness of having coins in the Bronze Age, but that they they pay with bronze, and he amasses that bronze, and that's how he is powerful in this film. He's shown rubbing bronze on his face. He loves the bronze. Uh, he uh, at one point, uh, when there's a possibility of, of a, a football match being cancelled, he whispers, you know, no refunds because. The more bronze he has from these people paying to see the football match, the more powerful he is. It's a very much a capitalist idea, a notion of, of, of monetary wealth, I guess, in that sense. But actually, what we know of the Bronze Age is that the opposite was kind of true. Lord Newth would not be amassing the bronze. He would be the person who knows the secret of the bronze, mixing tin and copper together. He would be the person who oversees the production and and in a sort of a mafioso kind of way the 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 way that bronze trickles into society so people would get to benefit from bronze maybe making pots and pans eventually if they would to do so but their access to bronze would be managed by Nuth in this instance uh, he wouldn't be wanting people to bring him bronze he would be in charge more or less of who got to to have access to bronze that is where Bronze Age power came from. It wasn't, it wasn't like money in that sense. It was sort of the opposite. You bought social capital, I guess, by knowing and having access to that power. So it's subtle, similarly subtle to Doug and the wheel and the, and the 
pots and pans, but it's something that they very much absolutely get wrong in this film. As the film progresses, the Bronze Age people are mining in the valley and they, and they open up ancient caves where Doug's ancestors were drawing stories on the walls and they, they, they share these stories, they show them to some of Doug's uh, tribe to try and undermine their confidence because the stories are, are of football failure in the past. Again, I'll come back to that at the end of the video. But I liked this. This is a bit of a positive, actually showing some of the ways that cave art might have been used to, to, to tell stories about the past, to share identity, uh, to learn maybe about hunting techniques or about certain t people or religious elements or, or simply maybe even just facts about the world. That's possibly one of the functions of cave art, and that is shown in this film. It is used in that way in this film, in that sense. Although, strangely, they do refer to some of the artwork that is outside as cave art, which is a bit odd, but that's just because most people watching the film will think of it as cave art. They won't really think about whether or not it's in a cave. So it's a positive, I think, that they use cave art in that way. At one point, something happens where... Uh, Doug and his friends are being threatened with the possibility of working in a mine. This is something that we see in the trailer, where uh, the response is, What's a mine? And if we don't beat them? We'll spend the rest of our lives working down a mine. No! What's a mine? <laughs> and on the face of it, it's, it's funny, you know, uh, this idea of prehistoric, primitive people not knowing what mining is. But actually, this is a negative, because we know that in Britain, for example, in the Neolithic, there were people in mines. They were using uh, using antlers and other tools to dig down into the ground to get hold of flint. There's a place called Grimes Graves, for example, which is a huge prehistoric Neolithic mine. So people would have been mining before the Bronze Age arrived. And, and this idea of what's a mine, it works for that sort of, that crass primitivism versus modernism kind of, you know, um, narrative, but it's a negative in terms of historical accuracy. People knew about mining and mines and digging into the ground before the Bronze Age uh, occurred. The final positive in this film is something which, I mean, <laughs> which I love. I love that I can now point to this and go, yes, yep, that's that's historically, yep, historically accurate, yep. <laughs> Because it only recently became historically accurate, and I love it. Uh, there's a point when Doug and his friends are hungry, and they see a duck in the distance, and they think, let's have some duck to eat. So they throw a stone at this thing, uh, expecting it you know, just to knock the duck out. And you get a close-up of the duck's head, and you're expecting this stone to come in and boof. But what you see is a little, boop, a little pebble bounce off the back of the duck. And you realise that this is a monstrous mallard. It's, it's, it turns around and goes, Rawr! it's got teeth, Rawr! chases them. And I love that this, in recent weeks, has become actually historically accurate for Neanderthals, uh, or for a Neanderthal that we've, we, we know of. Uh, seemingly, a child was consumed and di digested by a giant bird. <laughs> And um, this this throwaway joke, this ridiculous moment, probably the most ridiculous moment in the whole film, and actually they do have this, this mallard come back again, these giant webbed feet. And, uh, this thing is now a positive. I love that. I love that I can go, yep, there you go. Tick. I can sign that. Can sign off on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, uh, humans were chased by ducks. Oh, well, big birds uh, yeah, in the past. <laughs> The final negative that I'm going to mention for this film uh, is similar to that, that mapping back of capitalism onto Lord Nuth, in so much as this is a mapping back of another modernish attitude into the past. And this is, this is something I made a note of in my, in my notes, but also Mrs. Soup was really irritated by this presumption, and she asked me to, to mention it. Uh, it is the mapping back of patriarchy, the one-to-one -one relationship uh, between, I suppose, the 20th century, 21st century as well, and the Bronze Age. Uh, this is a film where lots of people are playing football, and there's a football stadium. And in this film, there is a, a young lady who is a Bronze Age woman. Uh, she's on the on the front cover here of the DVD. She meets Doug, 
And she is not allowed to play football in the stadium because she's a girl. And that's a really unnecessary, subtle, possibly even not, not, not necessarily considered uh, modern bias that they're putting onto the Bronze Age there. And I'm not just being hyper, hyper woke here. This is genuinely a, a, a complete cultural uh, hurdle that they haven't managed to get themselves over in the representation of the Bronze Age. There's no reason uh, to think that that, that, that that Bronze Age women, if they had football, couldn't have played football. Uh, there's, no, there's no absolute reason to think that necessarily uh, patrilineal modes of power were the way in which things worked. There, there are many matrilineal societies where identity and wealth and, and other things are passed down through, through female lines. So having this, girls don't play football, I'm sorry, but that just shows that this film was made by people of a certain age who <coughs> think of football in a certain way. And that's nothing to do with the Bronze Age, unfortunately. So there we go, a, a new format for these reviews, hopefully one that you guys appreciate. Uh, Early Man is worth watching. It is a fun film, it's an Aardman film, there's stuff there that you're going to be entertained by, but it just falls a bit flat for me and it doesn't live up to, to the greatness of the other Aardman movies. And as a representation of prehistory, it's for the most part irrelevant, really. Uh, for me, this film really lost me when it suddenly became a not-so-subtle analogy for the Englishman's crisis following the 1966 Football World Cup win. Of all things to put into this film, it's a really weird one. The idea is that, that people in Stone Age Manchester invented football, football spread out into the world, and then, after years of being beaten at, at their own game, people in Doug's tribe had just forgotten all entirely about football. Uh, and this is this is a not so subtle reference to the idea that the English invented football and now the Brazilians are beating us at it. Oh, when will we win the World Cup again? I, as a Welshman, but also, frankly, even if I wasn't a Welshman, I wouldn't necessarily be interested in seeing someone else's football crisis in a film that has so much potential to, to really play with that, that claymation, prehistory, you know, hammy, but also fun depiction of prehistory. They could, they, they could have had so much fun with this film, and instead they decided to make a, a soccer movie. It's a bit weird. It really is a bit strange. There are genuine moments of really entertaining gold in this film. For example, there's, there's, a, there's a messenger bird that's kind of like a flying dictaphone that passes messages between Lord Nuth and his queen over long distances. <clears throat> Hello? Hello? How do you use this message bird thing? It's the queen. Just speak into its ear, ma'am. It will mimic everything it hears. I don't even know if I'm holding it that... Testing? <coughs> Testing. Nooth? Nooth? Perhaps she's heard about the game. Oh, of course she hasn't heard about the game. I've heard about the game. <gasps> and, and, and there's a, there's a great gag where, where it's, it records, or is going to mimic the wrong, you know, he's insulting her, basically. And he's like, no, 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 and it flies away. That's brilliant. There are, there are just fantastic little moments in this film that you should watch it for. If, you, if it's on TV, give it a go, you know? Don't necessarily go out and buy the DVD, but, but have, watch it if you, if, if you ever get the chance and you've got nothing better to do. But for me, it just it just fell a bit flat, and especially when it became all about the English football crisis. I'm just not remotely interested at all. Anyway, guys, hopefully you've enjoyed this review. As ever, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.